section sixteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section sixteen the rule of the hans by rev william spear two hundred and six b c to two hundred and twenty one a d in this burning of the books the special aim was to destroy the volumes known as the nine classics the first five are these the shu king or book of history the shi king or book of odes the spring and autumn annals the book of rites and the book of changes of these five the last was used in divination and therefore was not destroyed the other four classics were written by mencius and the other pupils and followers of confucius they are the great learning the doctrine of the mean the confucian analects and the works of mencius in the course of time huang ti died and kao ti a book lover sat upon the throne orders were given to search the land for copies of the books then the delighted scholars hastened forward with the volumes or parts of volumes that they had risked their lives to save some had been hidden in caves in the roofs or walls of houses or under their floors and some had been carefully protected and buried in the beds of rivers a blind man was found who could recite more than one-fourth of the shu king and a young girl supplied another portion of the book seventy years after the death of huang ti the house of confucius was torn down and behold in the wall was found a complete copy of the work when kao ti became emperor in two hundred and six b c there were almost no books in the empire but within the two following centuries more than seven thousand were written kao ti was in many ways a noble man and an excellent ruler but he came to the throne because he was the leader of a successful rebellion the editor it is related of this adventurer kao ti that just after the breaking out of the rebellion he happened to meet a fortune-teller on the road who falling at his feet said he offered him this mark of homage because he saw by the lines in his face that he was destined shortly to become emperor in making this prediction the soothsayer no doubt foresaw the probability of its accomplishment for it was not an unlikely termination of the rebellion that the leader if successful should be placed on the throne with this belief therefore the stranger followed up his prophecy by offering his only daughter in marriage to the chief kao ti accepted the proposal and married the lady who was thus by her father's artifice raised to the dignity of empress for after many scenes of violence and bloodshed in which the lawful emperor lost his life the insurgents were victorious and their leader was raised to the imperial throne the new sovereign was a native of the kingdom of han one of those small states into which the empire had formerly been divided therefore he is called the founder of the han dynasty the princes of his race occupied the throne for more than four centuries the first of the race commenced one of the most celebrated periods of chinese history
in spite of the great wall the tartars continued their predatory warfare and sorely disquieted the more polished and peaceful chinese who vainly attempted to propitiate them with alliances and tribute the first emperors of this race endeavoured to make friends of the great tartar chiefs by giving them their daughters in marriage a native historian of the period exclaims our disgrace could not be exceeded from this time china lost her honour in the reign of the ninth emperor the tartars having been provoked by the punishment inflicted upon two of their chiefs who had transgressed the boundaries of the great wall while engaged in hunting the empire was again invaded by the erratic nations and a princess was demanded and yielded in marriage these incidents form the subject of one of the hundred plays of yuan an english version of which was printed in london under the name of the sorrows of han the impolitic system of buying off the barbarians which commenced thus early led many centuries afterwards to the total overthrow of the empire by the tartars during this period however the chinese made very important advances in civilization the arts and sciences were improved literature was encouraged agriculture was in a progressive state and several useful inventions date their origin from the same era among the latter one of the most important is the manufacture of paper which is supposed to have been commenced toward the end of the first century the egyptians had long possessed the art of making paper from the rush called papyrus which was also used at rome for the same purpose in the first century but that the chinese obtained their knowledge from either rome or egypt may well be doubted before they were acquainted with this useful art they were accustomed to write on thin slips of bamboo not with ink but with pointed tools similar to those used by engravers with which they cut or engraved the characters books were formed of bamboo by taking off the outside bark and cutting it into thin sheets all of the same shape and size which after the writing was finished were strung together in such a manner as to form a compact though rather clumsy volume at length about the year of our era ninety five it was ascertained by what means does not appear that bamboo might be made into a better material for writing upon than it furnished in its natural state by pounding it in a mortar with water until it becomes a thin paste which being spread out on a flat surface was dried into what we call paper the earliest specimens of this new art in china were probably a very rough description but the manufacture was gradually improved by the mixture of silk and other materials until the chinese were able to produce a paper of the most beautiful texture adapted for printing which we now call india paper and another kind for painting known by the name of rice paper the invention of paper naturally leads to that of ink which in china is always made in those cakes which are imported by the merchants of western countries under the name of indian ink it is used with the camel's hair pencils for writing by the chinese who do not require such pens as ours in the formation of their hieroglyphical characters end of section 16 this recording is in the public domain recording by jim lock of floyd virginia section 17 of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox org by jim lock of floyd virginia Rakan feeding the hungry spirit chinese painting page fifty two 
rakan feeding the hungry spirit from a chinese painting of the twelfth century the history of chinese painting is a long one reaching back to at least the third century b c the highest development was attained under the sung dynasty a d nine hundred and sixty to twelve hundred eighty the golden age of china especially in landscape and in religious paintings of which the picture shown here is a good example a rakan or buddhist holy man is feeding a wretched spirit that crouches before him in one hand he holds a bowl and with the other offers food to the starving spirit while his disciples regard the scene with an obvious expression of surprise at the length to which the rakan carries his charity buddha taught that the most rapid spiritual progress might be made by withdrawing from the world his rule for those who would devote themselves to the higher life required them to make their abode in the forest though after a time they were provided with monasteries in which they might live during the rainy season they were to dress in simple robes of dull yellow cloth made by sewing rags together their entire wealth must consist of a girdle a razor a needle an alms bowl and a strainer for all water drunk must be strained not to preserve the health of the drinker but rather the lives of any insects that might be in the liquid the rakan rose before daybreak washed swept around the bow tree sacred to the meditations of buddha brought the drinking water for the day and strained it placed flowers before the tree and meditated on his own faults and the virtues of buddha then taking his bowl he followed his superior on a begging tour for all food eaten must be obtained in this way after the single daily meal he retired and meditated on kindness and love after this he studied at sunset he swept the holy places and repeated to his superior what he had learned and listened to instruction he must also confess any wrong-doings of which he had been guilty so passed the day of one who would seek self-conquest and the joys of the higher life end of section seventeen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section eighteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Locke of Floyd, Virginia. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 18. The Three Religions by W. A. P. Martin the invention of gunpowder the compass and printing the manufactures of silk and of porcelain have all been claimed for china it is thought that the chinese were the earliest searchers for the philosopher's stone which should turn baser metals into gold and for the elixir of life by which one's years might be lengthened to whatever extent he chose the chinese have a legend that a demon once offered to teach an alchemist how to turn base metal into gold but will it remain gold the alchemist asked will it not return to its original elements certainly replied the demon but that need not trouble you for no such change will take place until ten thousand ages have passed the alchemist refused the gift i should rather live in poverty he said than bring a loss upon my fellow-men even after ten thousand ages have passed there had been for many years two religions in the country confucianism and taoism confucianism taught its followers to worship heroes their own ancestors and the powers of nature taoism claimed to have been founded by lao tse but if so it had wandered far from his teachings according to taoism there is a soul or a god in everything a god of fire of rain of thunder and so on the taoist priests gain a vast influence by persuading the chinese that they can save them from the attacks of evil spirits 
at the time of the birth of christ there was a vague feeling through the east that some great religious event had come to pass in the west the wise men from the east looked to the land of the hebrews and journeyed westward to jerusalem to ask where is he that is born king of the jews more than half a century later the rumour of a new faith had reached china and the emperor sent his brother together with eighteen officers of state and a long retinue of attendants to learn what it might be the commission went to india and there they were persuaded that buddhism as the teachings of buddha a former prince of india were called was the new faith of which they were in search a prominent part of buddhism is the belief in metempsychosis or transmigration of souls that is that when a man dies his soul enters some animal it is for this reason that the followers of buddha are forbidden to destroy any animal life the editor it is impossible to apportion the people among these several creeds they are all confucians all buddhists all taoists they all reverence confucius and worship their ancestors and employ the buddhist burial service and all resort to the magical devices of the taoists to protect themselves against the assaults of evil spirits or secure good luck in business they celebrate their marriages according to the confucian rites in building their houses they ask the advice of a taoist and in cases of alarming illness employ him to exorcise evil spirits at death they commit their souls to the keeping of the buddhists the people assert and with truth that these religions originally three have become one and they are accustomed to symbolize this unity by erecting san chao tang temples of the three religions in which confucius and lao tse appear on the right and left of buddha as forming a triad of sages this arrangement however gives great offence to some of the more zealous disciples of confucius and a few years ago a memorial was presented to the emperor praying him to demolish the san chao tang which stood near the tomb of their great teacher who has no equal but heaven in the lao chai a collection of tales there is a story which owes its humour to the bizarre intermixture of elements from each of the three religions a young nobleman riding out hawk in hand is thrown from his horse and taken up for dead on being conveyed to his house he opens his eyes and gradually recovers his bodily strength but to the grief of his family he is hopelessly insane he fancies himself a buddhist priest and insists on being conveyed to a distant province where he affirms he has passed his life in a monastery on arriving he proves himself to be the abbot and the mystery of his transfiguration is at once solved he had led a dissolute life and his flimsy soul unable to sustain the shock of death was at once dissipated the soul of a priest who had just expired happened to be floating by and took possession of the still warm corpse the young nobleman was a confucian of the modern type the idea of the soul changing its earthly tenement is buddhistic and that which rendered the metamorphosis possible without waiting for another birth was the taoist doctrine that the soul is dissolved with the body unless it be purified and concentrated by vigorous discipline End of section eighteen recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section nineteen of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by jim locke of floyd virginia dream and reality a buddhist story by chuang tzu fourth century b c once upon a time i dreamed i was a butterfly fluttering hither and thither to all intents and purposes a butterfly i was conscious only of following my fancies as a butterfly and was unconscious of my individuality as a man and there i lay myself again i do not know whether i was then dreaming i was a butterfly or whether i am now a butterfly dreaming that it is a man 
between man and butterfly there is necessarily a barrier and the transition is called metempsychosis end of section nineteen this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section twenty of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim locke of floyd virginia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section twenty milan the maiden chief by unknown from the third century a d to the seventh disorder and crime increased there was a northern an eastern and a western kingdom and there were attacks by the huns one emperor favoured buddhism another banished or slew its priests and destroyed their books in the very death chamber of an emperor one of his sons struck down another that he might gain the kingdom for himself extravagance was carried so far as to become wickedness one ruler built himself a magnificent palace large enough to shelter his ten thousand attendants his bodyguard was a regiment of superbly dressed women mounted on horseback on his amusements money was spent like water wherever he went he found bodies of his subjects hanging from the trees for they had chosen suicide rather than death by starvation but this was nothing to him and his wild extravagance continued one emperor used to run through the streets with a drawn sword slaying every one that was so unfortunate as to come in his way another saw the enemy coming and instead of defending his city he occupied himself in burning the royal library saying that all his studying of books was of no avail when the time of his need had come and now they should be destroyed freaks and vagaries ruled the land now and then an emperor arose who loved his people and punished whoever oppressed them one such sovereign was poisoned by his own mother it is small wonder that with his last breath he besought buddha never again to send him to earth as an emperor from this time of warfare come many stories of brave deeds one commander turned a hopeless defence into a victory by his quickness of wit as the foe advanced he threw open the gates of the city called away the sentinels took a seat on a tower in full view and began to play merrily on his guitar naturally the enemy supposed that he had some scheme in hand which made him absolutely certain of safety and they withdrew another commander was so nearly overcome by famine that the enemy confidently expected a surrender within a few days one night the besiegers heard the men in the hostile camp hard at work tramping to and fro in the morning they saw great heaps of rice beside the road this meant of course that food and reinforcements had reached the camp during the night and they retreated they did not guess that the heaps were of sand and that the thin covering of rice was the last bit of food in the possession of the starving soldiers in these times of constant fighting it happened more than once that a woman held a fort against an invading enemy such a warrior was mulan this poem was written between five hundred and two and five hundred and fifty six a d the editor say maiden at your spinning wheel why heave that deep drawn sigh is it fear perchance or love you feel pray tell oh tell me why nor fear nor love has moved my soul away such idle thought a warrior's glory is the goal by my ambition sought my father's cherished life to save my country to redeem the dangers of the field i'll brave i am not what i seem no son has he his troop to lead no brother dear have i 
so i must mount my father's steed and to the battle high at dawn of day she quits her door at evening rests her head where loud the mountain torrents roar and mail-clad soldiers tread the northern plains are gained at last the mountains sink from view the sun shines cold and the wintry blast it pierces through and through a thousand foes around her fall and red blood stains the ground but mulan who survives it all returns with glory crowned before the throne they bend the knee in the palace of chanagan full many a knight of high degree but the bravest is mulan nay prince she cries my duty's done no guerdon i desire but let me to my home be gone to cheer my aged sire she nears the door of her father's home a chief with trumpets blare but when she doffs her waving plume she stands a maiden fair End of section twenty this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke of floyd virginia section twenty one of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section twenty one the prodigal emperor wong ti by rounceville wildman in the middle of the sixth century ruled one wong ti the most reckless and wildly extravagant emperor that ever occupied the dragon throne wong ti lived a short life and a merry one no expenditure appalled him and no sacrifice of blood and treasure deterred him from following to the very end any of his fancies even the building of the canal system that has made his name famous was a whim for the gratification of his own pleasures he wished to visit all the prominent cities of the empire in the most comfortable and luxurious way he ordered that canals be immediately dug from the river pin a branch of the han in hupe to the river si a short stream in shantung another from si to communicate with the river huai and that the existing watercourses be widened at the same time he ordered built forty thousand dragon boats for the accommodation of his three thousand favorites and immediate court the canals were not mere ditches but magnificent examples of both engineering and artistic skill nothing was left unfinished to offend the critical eye of the dandy they were one hundred and twenty feet wide lined with cut stone with paved roads on either side shaded by full-grown trees taskmasters drove the laborers day and night and of the million men employed it is stated that over forty per cent died in the first royal journey from lo yang the capital to nanking the procession of boats extended for over sixty miles and eighty thousand soldiers were detailed to drag them the royal barge was two hundred feet long and forty feet high with four decks every district through which they passed was levied upon for provisions to support this immense host in transit the magnificent pageant swept through the empire for eight months the wonder and ruin of all who came within its reach the vast palaces gardens towns artificial lakes and mountains that wang ti the magnificent built in the short twelve years of his reign were according to the custom of the times destroyed by his successor but the canals remained a blessing to the descendants of the laborers who had died in their construction nebuchadnezzar the pharaohs nero and louis the fourteenth were but feeble imitators of this royal chinese spendthrift cleopatra's barge and babylon's hanging gardens were duplicated on a magnificent scale by wang ti he had a godlike genius for spending money in his palace garden which was so great that it contained an artificial lake three miles wide and three artificial islands one hundred feet high the flowering shrubs and trees were kept in perpetual bloom by skilled workmen 
who renewed every fallen flower with such exquisite imitation in silk and satin that no one could tell the natural from the artificial at a short distance after his death it was discovered that he had used all up the precious metals in the empire and that money was so scarce that pieces of leather and paper with their values stamped upon them had to be used in trade he took his dethronement with the same gay nonchalance with which he had sat upon the throne to his queen he said joy and sorrow both come to every man let us then bear each as it comes and make the best of life we can and of his princely executioners he asked politely disinterested what sin have i committed that you wish to take away my life sin they replied why what sin is there that you have not been guilty of what you say may be true answered the royal chesterfield hand me the silken cord i have had more pleasure in my life than you can have at my death the house of tang opened a new era in the history of china and marked the close of what might be styled the middle ages it has appropriately been called the augustan age of chinese literature each emperor strove to outdo his predecessors in the fostering of scholars and the education of the gentry great libraries were established schools sprang up poets essayists and historians thronged the successive courts the complete poems of the tang dynasty will be found in the home of every well-to-do chinaman of to-day the writings of confucius were annotated and popularized and in seven hundred and forty that deathless teacher was raised to the rank of a prince and his statue placed above that of the famous duke of chow the sixth emperor of the tongues founded han lin college a d seven fifty five the great postgraduate university of china end of section twenty one this recording is in the public domain Section 22 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Mona Jahin. China Part 4. The Augustan Age. Historical Note. The most glorious period of Chinese history is from 618 to 1126 A.D under the tang and sang dynasties the boundaries of the empire were extended from the caspian sea to the pacific ocean commerce flourished and embassies were received from nations as far apart as rome and japan printing from blocks was in use by the chinese in the ninth century Six hundred years before John Gutenberg set up his press in Germany, and it imparted a powerful stimulus to bookmaking and to the founding of schools and libraries. End of section 22. This recording is in the public domain. Section 23 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 23 tai tsung the good by rev william spear the emperor tai tsung is celebrated by the chinese as one of their most illustrious sovereigns and he appears to have merited the praises bestowed on him for his clemency wisdom justice and general attention to the welfare of the people under the auspices of this enlightened prince learning and the arts flourished as in the ancient times and all the high offices were again filled by men of letters while in order to promote the revival of literature which had so long been neglected for war 
an academy was instituted within the precincts of the palace where not less than eight thousand students received instruction from the most able professors tai tsung also founded a great school for archery where he often attended himself for the purpose of practising that warlike art in which it was important for the chinese to excel as bows and arrows were their principal weapons the ministers sometimes remonstrated with the emperor on the imprudence of trusting himself among the archers but the good prince only replied am i not the father of my people what then should i fear from my children the attention of tai tsung was constantly directed toward improving the condition of the lower orders which he effected in a material degree by lessening the taxes and sending commissioners into all the provinces to inquire into the conduct of the magistrates and to see that the poor were not oppressed by them for he often expressed the benevolent wish that every poor man should have enough of the common necessaries of life to make him comfortable in his station which may remind us of the well-known speech of henry the fourth of france that he should not be satisfied till every peasant in the kingdom could afford to have a fowl in his pot on the sunday his strict sentiments with regard to the administration of justice induced him to pass a law for the prevention of bribery by making it an offence punishable with death for any magistrate to receive a present as a propitiation in the exercise of his power and in order to ascertain whether this law had its proper effect he employed a person to offer a bribe to a certain magistrate of whose integrity he had some suspicion the bribe was accepted and the guilty magistrate condemned to death but his life was saved by the interference of one of the ministers who were always at liberty to speak freely to the emperors on the subject of their conduct great prince said the monitor the magistrate is guilty and therefore deserves to die according to the law but are not you who tempted him to commit the crime a sharer in his guilt the emperor at once admitted that he was so and pardoned the offender during the reign of tai tsung some christian missionaries of the nestorian church first arrived in china where they were well received by the emperor who permitted them to build churches and preach christianity among the people they were successful in making many converts one of whom was a minister of state they gave to the tartar tribes on the north of china their own syriac alphabet and great numbers of those people became christians when the first roman priests visited china they found the sign of the cross in use and other customs which bore evidence of the former influence of the nestorians a tablet was discovered at the city of Singan, cut in the syriac character which relates the success of their early labours their missionary zeal deserves great honour it conferred lasting benefits upon the nations of eastern asia the emperor tai tsung died after a reign of twenty-three years regretted by his subjects who looked up to him as a pattern of wisdom and virtue and preserved many of his excellent maxims which are frequently repeated with great veneration to this day the successors of tai tsung maintained the peace and prosperity which had been established by that great prince and under their dominion the country was much improved and the people enjoyed a considerable share of comfort and tranquillity among the great national works of the seventh century were several extensive canals for the convenience of inland commerce with locks of a peculiar construction or slides placed in embankments over which their flat-bottomed vessels without being unloaded were hauled by ropes attached to large capstans by means of this inland communication trade was so much increased that a great number of vessels came every year to the port of kan fu which was either canton or kan pu near hang chau and about the year seven hundred a d a regular market was opened there for foreign merchandise and an imperial commissioner was appointed to receive the customs on all goods imported from other countries 
which collectively produced a large revenue to the government end of section twenty three this recording is in the public domain section twenty four of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox org by brianna the rule of the empress wu by s wells williams taitsung was succeeded by his son kaotsung whose indolent imbecility appears the more despicable after his father's vigor but his reign fills a large place in chinese history from the extraordinary career of his empress empress wu as she is called who by her blandishments obtained entire control over him the character of this woman has no doubt suffered much from the bad reputation native historians have given her but enough can be gathered from their accounts to show that with all her cruelty she understood how to maintain the authority of the crown and provide for the wants of the people introduced to the harem of taitsung at the age of fourteen she was sent at his death to the retreat where all his women were condemned for the rest of their days to honorable imprisonment while a member of the palace kao tsung had been charmed with her appearance and having seen her at one of the state ceremonies connected with the ancestral worship brought her back to the palace as soon as she became empress wu began gradually to assume more and more authority until long before the emperor's death in six hundred eighty four she engrossed the whole management of affairs and at his demise openly assumed the reins of government which she wielded for twenty-one years with no weak hand her generals extended the limits of the empire and her officers carried into effect her orders to alleviate the miseries of the people her cruelty vented itself in the murder of all who opposed her will even her own sons and relatives and her pride was rather exhibited than gratified by her assuming the titles of queen of heaven holy and divine ruler holy mother and divine sovereign when she was disabled by age her son supported by some of the first men of the land asserted his claim to the throne and by a palace conspiracy succeeded in removing her to her own apartments where she died aged eighty-one years end of section twenty four this recording is in the public domain section twenty five of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 25 The Founding of Han Lin College by Reverend William Speer. The Sixth Emperor of the Tang Dynasty founded the han lin college the leading literary institution of the chinese empire consisting of forty members from whose number the ministers of state are generally chosen and from whom all successful candidates for honors receive their degrees the members of the han lin are mentioned in old histories as the learned doctors of the empire and in fact possessed quite as much knowledge in those days as they do now for the members of the present day are all educated according to the ancient system nor have any new branches of learning until recently been introduced into the schools of china 
yet when the hanlin college was founded the chinese were far in advance of the europeans both in knowledge and refinement for the modern nations of europe were then only just emerging from the barbarism into which they had been plunged by the conquests of the gothic tribes england was divided among the princes of the heptarchy and france was in that rude state which preceded the reign of charlemagne it may be imagined that only a very small proportion of the boys in any school were gifted with such great talents as would entitle them to attain preferment therefore of the many who presented themselves as candidates for honours at the hall of their province where an examination was held once a year very few perhaps were chosen and those had to pass other examinations by doctors of a higher degree before they were eligible to be appointed to offices of state still each aspirant had a chance and as the object was so important great pains were taken to instil into the minds of youth a due sense of the value of learning and many little stories written with that intent were read to children as soon as they were of an age to comprehend them these juvenile tales are mostly very simple but are not uninteresting as illustrations of the character and manners of the people the following are specimens of their general style there was a boy whose father was so poor that he could not afford to send him to school but was obliged to make him work all day in the fields to help to maintain his family the lad was so anxious to learn that he proposed giving up a part of the night to study but as his mother had not the means of supplying him with a lamp for that purpose he brought home every evening a glow-worm which being held in a thin piece of gauze and applied to the lines of a book gave sufficient light to enable him to read and thus he acquired so much knowledge that in course of time he became a minister of state and supported his parents with ease and comfort in their old age another youth who was rather dull of intellect found it a very laborious task to apply himself to learning and made such slow progress that he was often rather disheartened yet he was not idle and for several years continued to study with unceasing diligence at length the time arrived for his examination and he repaired with many others to the hall of the province where he had the mortification after all his exertions of being dismissed as unqualified to pass in returning homeward very much depressed in spirits and thinking it would be better to give up literary pursuits altogether and turn his attention to some other employment he happened to see an old woman busily employed in rubbing an iron pestle on a whetstone what are you doing there good mother said he i am grinding down this pestle replied the old dame till it becomes sharp enough to use for working embroidery and she continued her employment li pi such was the name of the student struck with the patience and perseverance of the woman applied her answer to his own case she will no doubt succeed at last said he then why should i despair so he returned to his studies and in a few years on appearing again before the board he acquitted himself so well that he passed with honour and rose in time to one of the highest offices in the state these short and simple tales of which the chinese have whole volumes serve to show the bias they have endeavoured to give to the minds of their children and account for the studious habits of so large a portion of the community end of section twenty five this recording is in the public domain section twenty six of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox .org by andrea the binding of feet by rev william spear it was about this period that the strange custom was first adopted in china of binding the feet of female children to prevent their growth the origin of this absurd and unnatural practice is unknown nor is it easy to imagine what could have induced women in the first instance thus to deform themselves for although vanity may be a powerful incitement for the continuance of a custom which distinguishes the higher from the lower classes it hardly accounts for the first introduction of this practice 
as any other distinctive mark, less painful and less inconvenient, might have answered the same purpose. The daughters of all people of rank are obliged to submit at an early age to have their feet cramped up and confined with bandages, which are not removed for about three years, when the bones are so far compressed that the feet never assume their natural shape and size. The health of the children generally suffers much from the want of proper exercise during this cruel process, and the enjoyment of afterlife must be greatly diminished by the difficulty which females find in walking or even standing without support. Yet they are proud of their very helplessness, and would think it excessively vulgar to be able to walk with a firm and dignified step. The lower classes cannot follow a fashion which would disable them from pursuing their daily labors. Yet many parents, in a very humble station of life, are not free from the vanity of desiring to have one daughter with small feet, the prettiest child being usually selected for that distinction. And such is the force of fashion that the little damsel who is thus tortured and crippled is looked upon as an object of envy rather than of pity. End of section 26 This recording is in the public domain. Section number 27 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Read for LibriVox.org by Hollis House. Printing by Reverend William Spear. It was in the ninth century that printing began to be practiced in China, an event which occurred about five hundred years before the art was known in Europe. The method first adopted in China was to engrave the characters on stone. Consequently, when the impression was taken off, the ground of the paper was black and the letters were white. But this mode was shortly superseded by the invention of wooden blocks, cut in such a manner that the letters were raised instead of indented, and thus were impressed in black on white ground. This mode of printing from wood is still practiced in China, and is well adapted to the written language of the Chinese, as its words are not formed of vowels and consonants like those of Western languages, but a single character of which there are many thousands, expresses a whole word. Yet it is necessarily very slow, and for this reason must yield in the end to the use of divisible metal type and of our swift machinery. The superior beauty of the typography of our books already wins the wonder and praise of the Chinese. Before the invention of printing, there must have been a vast number of Chinese constantly employed in writing, as they were always a reading people and even the poorest peasants were able to obtain books in manuscript, while in Europe a book was a thing unknown among the lower classes, and seldom to be met with except in monasteries or palaces of princes. End of section 27 This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Jim Locke. China, Part 5. The Coming of the Tartars. Historical Note. The Tartars of Mongols are in some respects the most remarkable race that has inhabited the world their armies the mightiest that have ever been gathered together conquered and ruled an empire the greatest in population and extent that has ever existed they bore their ox-hide banners over every state of europe and asia save spain england and japan and for more than a thousand years terrorized a great part of the human race the toll of lives taken by genghis khan alone is reckoned at four and one half million the tartars had been the torment of china for many ages and during the tenth and eleventh centuries they had become much more powerful in nine hundred and twenty six the khatan tartars helped to 
overthrow one of the chinese dynasties but when the new ruler came to the throne they claimed their reward sixteen cities and an annual tribute of three hundred thousand taels of silver about two hundred and eighty thousand dollars and a great number of pieces of silk neither arms nor tribute nor the gift of princesses availed and early in the twelfth century the chinese invited the kin tartars the ancestors of the present manchus to drive the katans from a province that they had seized the kin had not the slightest objection to performing this neighbourly office they drove the katans out but they kept the province for themselves one chinese ruler tried his best to gain their good will by flattery when he addressed their chief he spoke of himself as chin that is your servant but even this humility did not win them and they pushed on their conquest to the yangtze kiang river End of section twenty eight this recording is in the public domain recording by jim locke section twenty nine of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sandra schmidt the world's story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section twenty nine the tartars and their customs by marco polo to the north of china lived the tartars a wild savage wandering tribe their custom is to spend the winter in warm plains where they find good pasture for their cattle whilst in summer they betake themselves to a cool climate among the mountains and valleys where water is to be found as well as woods and pastures their houses are circular and are made of wands covered with felt these are carried along with them whithersoever they go for the wands are so strongly bound together and likewise so well combined that the frame can be made very light whenever they erect these huts the door is always to the south they also have wagons covered with black felt so efficaciously that no rain can get in these are drawn by oxen and camels and the women and children travel in them the women do the buying and selling and whatever is necessary to provide for the husband and household for the men all lead the life of gentlemen troubling themselves about nothing but hunting and hawking and looking after their goshawks and falcons unless it be the practice of warlike exercises they live on the milk and meat which their herds supply and on the produce of the chase and they eat all kinds of flesh including that of horses and dogs and pharaohs rats the gerbo of which last there are great numbers in burrows on the plains their drink is mare's milk this is the fashion of their religion they say there is a most high god of heaven whom they worship daily with thurible and incense but they pray to him only for health of mind and body but they have also a certain other god of theirs called natigai and they say he is the god of the earth who watches over their children cattle and crops they show him great worship and honour and every man has a figure of him in his house made of felt and cloth and they also make in the same manner images of his wife and children the wife they put on the left hand and the children in front and when they eat they take the fat of the meat and grease the god's mouth withal as well as the mouths of his wife and children then they take of the broth and sprinkle it before the door of the house and that done they deem that their god and his family have had their share of the dinner the clothes of the wealthy tartars are for the most part of gold and silk stuffs lined with costly furs such as sable and ermine ver and fox skin in the richest fashion all their harness of war is excellent and costly their arms are bows and arrows sword and mace but above all the bow for they are capital archers indeed 
the best that are known on their backs they wear armour of queer bouillie prepared from buffalo and other hides which is very strong they are excellent soldiers and passing valiant in battle they are also more capable of hardship than other nations for many a time if need be they will go for a month without any supply of food living only on the milk of their mares and on such game as their bows may win them their horses also will subsist entirely on the grass of the plains so that there is no need to carry store of barley or straw or oats and they are very docile to their riders these in case of need will abide on horseback the livelong night armed at all points while the horse will be continually grazing of all troops in the world these are they which endure the greatest hardship and fatigue and which cost the least and they are the best of all for making wide conquests of country and this you will perceive from what you have heard and shall hear in this book and as a fact there can be no manner of doubt that now they are the masters of the biggest half of the world their troops are admirably ordered in the manner that i shall now relate you see when a tartar prince goes forth to war he takes with him say one hundred thousand horse well he appoints an officer to every ten men one to every hundred one to every thousand and one to every ten thousand so that his own orders have to be given to ten persons only and each of these ten persons has to pass the orders to other ten and so on no one having to give orders to more than ten and every one in turn is responsible only to the officer immediately over him and the discipline and order that comes of this method is marvellous for they are a people very obedient to their chiefs and when the army is on the march they have always two hundred horsemen very well mounted who are sent a distance of two marches in advance to reconnoitre and these always keep ahead they have a similar party detached in the rear and on either flank so that there is a good lookout kept on all sides against a surprise when they are going on a distant expedition they take no gear with them except two leather bottles for milk a little earthenware pot to cook their meat in and a little tent to shelter them from rain and in case of great urgency they will ride ten days on end without lighting a fire or taking a meal on such an occasion they will sustain themselves on the blood of their horses opening a vein and letting the blood jet into their mouths drinking till they have had enough and then stanching it they have also milk dried into a kind of paste to carry with them and when they need food they put this in water and beat it up until it dissolves and then drink it it is prepared in this way they boil the milk and when the rich part floats on the top they skim it into another vessel and of that they make butter for the milk will not become solid till this is removed then they put the milk in the sun to dry and when they go on an expedition every man takes some ten pounds of this dried milk with him and of a morning he will take a half pound of it and put it into his leather bottle with as much water as he pleases so as he rides along the milk paste and the water in the bottle get well churned together into a kind of pep and that makes his dinner when they come to an engagement with the enemy they will gain the victory in this fashion they never let themselves get into a regular medley but keep perpetually riding round and shooting into the enemy and as they do not count it any shame to run away in battle they will sometimes pretend to do so and in running away they turn in the saddle and shoot hard and strong at the foe and in this way make great havoc their horses are trained so perfectly that they will double hither and thither just like a dog in a way that is quite astonishing thus they fight to as good purpose in running away as if they stood and faced the enemy because of the vast volley of arrows that they shoot in this way turning round upon their pursuers who are fancying that they have won the battle but when the tartars see that they have killed and wounded a good many horses and men they wheel round bodily and return to the charge in perfect order and with loud cries and in a very short time the enemy are routed in truth they are stout and valiant soldiers and inured to war and you perceive that it is just when the enemy sees them run and imagines that he has gained the battle 
that he has in reality lost it for the tartars wheel around in a moment when they judge the right time has come and after this fashion they have won many a fight all this that i have been telling you is true of the manners and customs of the genuine tartars but i must add that in these days they are greatly degenerated for those who are settled in cathay have taken up the practices of the idolaters of the country and have abandoned their own institutions whilst those who have settled in the levant have adopted the customs of the saracens the way they administer justice is this when any one has committed a petty theft they give him under the orders of authority seven blows of a stick or seventeen or twenty-seven or thirty-seven or forty-seven and so forth always increasing by tens in proportion to the injury done and running up to one hundred and seven of these beatings sometimes they die but if the offence be horse-stealing or some other great matter they cut the thief in two with a sword howbeit if he be able to ransom himself by paying nine times the value of the thing stolen he is let off every lord or other person who possesses beasts has them marked with his peculiar brand be they horses mares camels oxen cows or other great cattle and then they are sent abroad to graze over the plains without any keeper they get all mixed together but eventually every beast is recovered by means of its owner's brand which is known for their sheep and goats they have shepherds all their cattle are remarkably fine big and in good condition they have another notable custom which is this if any man have a daughter who dies before marriage and another man have had a son also die before marriage the parents of the two arrange a grand wedding between the dead lad and lass and marry them they do making a regular contract and when the contract papers are made out they put them into the fire in order as they will have it that the parties in the other world may know the fact and so look on each other as man and wife and the parents henceforth consider themselves sib to each other just as if their children had lived and married whatever may be agreed on between the parties as dowry those who have to pay it cause to be painted on pieces of paper and then put these into the fire saying that in that way the dead person will get all the real articles in the other world end of section twenty nine this recording is in the public domain section thirty of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the world story volume one china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tapan section thirty the chinese theatre by archibald little when travelling in china through the scenes made famous in song and history i have been astonished at the accurate knowledge of the old wars and dynasties displayed by illiterate boatmen on the river and by our porters on land journeys they are never tired of pointing out historic sites to the foreign traveller and expatiating upon the great deeds of former generations it was a long time before i could learn whence these men derived their knowledge so far surpassing the acquaintance with history displayed by similar classes in our own country i at last discovered that they had learned their history in that pleasantest and most impressive of all schools the theatre elaborate historical dramas form the bulk of the performances given in the public theatre which almost every village in china possesses by companies of strolling players who are paid by subscriptions from the more wealthy inhabitants these companies are generally hired for a week or a fortnight the performance commences at noon and goes on till about nine at night the extraordinary endurance of the actors an endurance characteristic of the chinese in all their avocations is shown by the long successive hours they spend upon the stage 
and as all the important pieces are sung to the accompaniment of the band how they support the strain upon the voice is almost incomprehensible they have a large repertoire which they carry in their heads many of them have no books of the plays they are apprenticed as children and so learn the pieces by rote at an age when the memory is especially vigorous a mark of attention to a distinguished visitor is to hand him the repertoire and ask him to choose a play out of some hundred pieces contained therein i have often selected an unpopular and seldom performed play and never found the test too much for them the piece being produced immediately on the other hand should a play on the program happen to contain a character of the same name as that of the visitor it is at once suppressed although there is no scenery the dresses are extremely handsome elaborate embroideries being worn by princes and generals and generally the dressing and get-up are careful and accurate there is no curtain and no drop scene and curiously enough there is no interval between successive plays only a peculiar note is sounded on the cymbals a signal known to the initiated this has led europeans to state that a chinese play went on forever it is true that sometimes when a succession of historical plays is given the same story may go on for three or four successive days there is moreover one celebrated play which has no less than twenty-four acts as a rule however the lighter chinese pieces are even shorter than ours while theatricals are being performed the whole village is on fete all in their best clothes the ladies in the galleries with little tables on which are tea and cakes and other delicacies while families in the wide area of the open pit sit all day long with their tea and pipes enjoying themselves in a way that it is a pleasure to see in the cities plays are given in the very handsome theatres attached to the guild halls of which every large trading city in china has several performances are given on the feast days of the guilds when the members are invited to the dinners quite as elaborate as those given by our own city companies the feast which extends over several hours is accompanied with much ceremony and ancient ritual observances while the plays go on uninterruptedly a common penalty when disputes are arbitrated by the guilds is fining the defendant in a theatrical performance which if extended over the usual three days costs about ten pounds the average number of a company being thirty men female parts being all taken by men and boys as in the middle ages during their long hours of song the actors are refreshed by means of shabbily dressed coolies who walk casually on to the stage and hand them tea at intervals but whom the audience are supposed to regard as invisible rough indications of scenery are given in a primitive way a beleaguered general sitting on a chair raised on a table addressing an actor standing on the stage is supposed to be parleying with the commander of the besieging force cavalry are indicated by a whip held in the hand and when dismounting or mounting to ride off they go through the action of bestriding a horse the actors who take women's parts speak in a high falsetto voice and in their make-up and get-up are indistinguishable from real women a table covered with an embroidered cloth may represent a throne or with plain red cloth a magistrate's yeoman end of section 30 this recording is in the public domain Section 31 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator. Nemo as the emperor. Todd as the attendant. Eva Davis as the lady princess. Thora Hale as the envoy. And Thomas Peter as the president of the council. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 31. The Sorrows of Han, by Unknown. The Tartars realized how much more civilized the Chinese were than they themselves, and the savage chief, who had just overcome a Chinese force in battle, was often willing to make peace if a Chinese princess might be sent him for his wife it is upon this custom that the following play is founded with only two actors on the stage of the theatre there is not often an opportunity to bring out in conversation who a man is and what he is seeking and so the chief characters have to make little speeches and introduce themselves in the prologue to this play the khan of the tartars appears first declares his greatness and speaks of the custom of wedding a princess of china then comes the minister who is bidden to search out beautiful maidens that the emperor may choose among them in act two the minister declares that he has found the loveliest woman in the world he admits her to the palace but as her father is too poor to give him a bribe he disfigures her portrait that she may have no chance of being chosen by the emperor behold the emperor enters and finds her playing on a lute the editor since the beauties were selected to grace our palace we have not yet discovered a worthy object on whom to fix our preference vexed and disappointed we pass the stay of leisure roaming in search of her who may be destined for our imperial choice he is the lute is not that some lady's lute it is i hasten to advise her of your majesty's approach no hold keeper of the yellow gate discover to what part of our palace that lady pertains and bid her approach our presence but beware lest you alarm her attendant approaches in the direction of the sound and speaks what lady plays there the emperor comes approach to meet him lady advances keeper of the yellow gate see that the light burns brightly within your gauze lamp and hold it nearer to us lady approaching had your handmaid but known it was your majesty she would have been less tardy forgive then this delay truly this is a very perfect beauty from what quarter come such superior charms my name is chow my father cultivates at chitu the fields which he has derived from his family born in a humble station i am ignorant of the manners that befit a palace but with such uncommon attractions what chance has kept you from our sight when i was chosen by the minister my uncle show he demanded of my father an amount of treasure which our poverty could not supply he therefore disfigured my portrait by representing a scar under the eyes and caused me to be consigned to seclusion and neglect keeper of the yellow gate bring us that picture that we may view it seize the picture ah how has he dimmed the purity of the gem bright as the waves in autumn to the attendant transmit our pleasure to the officer of the guard to behead mayupin show and report to us his execution my parents sir are subject to the tax in their native district let me entreat your majesty to remit their contributions and extend favor towards them that shall readily be done approach and hear our imperial pleasure we create you a princess of our palace how unworthy is your handmaid 
of such gracious distinction goes to the form of returning thanks early to-morrow i attend your majesty's commands in this place the emperor is gone let the attendant close the doors i will retire to rest the false minister contrives to escape to the tartars he shows to the tartar khan a true portrait of the princess and persuades him to demand her hand in marriage the khan does this with the threat that if the maiden is refused he will ravage the country the emperor's counsellors insist that for the sake of the empire the princess shall be given up and at length the emperor yields in act three the princess grieves at leaving the palace and going to the winds and snows and the strange husband of a foreign land there is a farewell scene between her and the emperor alas when shall i again behold your majesty i will take off my robes of distinction and leave them behind me to-day in the palace of han to-morrow i shall be a spouse to a stranger i cease to wear these splendid vestments they shall no longer adorn my beauty in the eyes of men again let us urge you princess to depart we have delayed but too long already tis done princess when you are gone let your thoughts forbear to dwell with sorrow and resentment upon us they part and am i the great monarch of the line of han let your majesty cease to dwell with such grief upon this subject she is gone in vain have we maintained those armed heroes on the frontier mention but swords and spears and they tremble at their hearts like a young deer the princess has this day performed what belonged to themselves and yet they affect the semblance of men your majesty is entreated to return to the palace dwell not so bitterly sir on her memory allow her to depart did i not think of her i had a heart of iron a heart of iron the tears of my grief stream in a thousand channels this evening shall her likeness be suspended in the palace where i will sacrifice to it and tapers with her silver lights shall illuminate her chamber let your majesty return to the palace the princess is already far distant the princess is now seen in the camp of the tartars on the bank of the amur river and in despair she throws herself into the stream the khan refuses to keep in his domain such a traitor as maui and shao and in act four the minister is given over to the emperor and his head is struck off as an offering to the shades of the princess End of section 31. This recording is in the public domain. Section 32 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra. The World's Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section thirty two genghis khan the perfect warrior by d pettis de la croix another tartar force was now coming to the front their leader was a remarkable man whose name as a child was temuchin his father had been chief of several tribes he died leaving the boy of thirteen to take his place naturally some of the tribes promptly revolted but the mother of temuchin seized her son's banner and by the aid of those who were still faithful she brought back half of the rebels until the boy had become a man of forty-four years he had to fight against enemies and be on his guard against traitors at length the time came when he felt that his position was secure he called together his chief men and told them that the fates had promised him the rule of the whole earth they were enthusiastic for they had already seen the ability of their leader he took the name of genghis khan or perfect warrior 
and gave his people the name of mongols or the bold he made laws and had some books translated from foreign languages one tribe rose against him but he soon subdued it the editor all things looked now as if he desired to live in repose and taste the sweets of that peaceful estate which by such vast fatigues he had obtained but the love of arms the darling passion of his soul permitted him not to rest and he thought of nothing else but how to find a pretext to fall out with the chinese against whom in particular he had formed some designs the present state of affairs all being now in peace affording him no means to quarrel he sought amongst the transactions of past ages for something fit to urge against them and calling to mind the injuries the kings of china had heretofore done to his ancestors nay to his own father and people he conferred with his nevians and other princes of his court continually entertaining them with discourses of the injuries and wrongs their fathers had suffered by the chinese this was the cause said he that our country was looked upon with so much scorn and despised by the other nations of asia in fine he excited them to revenge by urging them that they had no other way to vindicate their honour and make themselves famous to posterity neither did he forget to remind them of the promise god had made to him to assist and render him victorious over all his enemies the mogul princes and lords failed not to applaud their emperor's design whether it was out of complaisance or that they found it agreeable to reason and justice is not the question a council was called to consult on ways and means how to bring this great enterprise to pass and it was resolved that first of all an ambassador be sent to altu khan king of china to demand satisfaction for all the damages and injuries done to the moguls by his predecessors with orders that in case he refused to comply war should be declared against him for this purpose they chose jaffa an old courtier a man perfectly skilled in state affairs and sent him away in the winter season jaffa being arrived at kambaluk which was the old city of peking one of the capital cities of cathay had an audience of the king whom he accidentally found in this city for he was not used to reside there but only in the summer this ambassador made a long harangue which he began with expostulating on his master's greatness his elevation to the empire of the moguls and tartars and the choice god had made of him to govern the world he afterwards demanded reparation of the king for all the damages and injuries which his predecessor had done the moguls telling him that if he refused to comply with these demands he had orders to declare war against him and to assure him that genghis khan at the head of a most powerful army would come and drive him out of his kingdom and establish one of his own children on his throne jaffa's discourse appeared very surprising to the king of china who was much astonished that the mogul emperor should form such a design and venture to attack and begin a war against a nation whom he had reason to fear considering the great damages and losses he himself confessed his nation had sustained by them the king complained to the ambassador saying your master treats me as if he thought me a turk or a mogul and with this answer he sent him back go tell genghis khan that although i cannot hinder him from making war with me yet i will meet him with an army that shall make him repent his rashness jaffa returned with all diligence to karakorum and gave his master an account of his negotiations and the observations he had made pursuant to the orders he had given him end of section thirty two this recording is in the public domain section thirty three of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox dot org by sandra genghis khan captures peking by d petit de la croix although the king of china had put abundance of troops into peking the mongols instigated by the chinese rebels that accompanied them resolved to lay siege to this city they even tried to take it by assault but the prince of china to whom the king his father had entrusted the management of the first war defended it so vigorously that all the besiegers efforts proved in vain 
it was impossible to tell how many brave actions were performed on both sides during the siege by reason that the fate of china seemed to depend on the good or ill fortune of this its capital city the bravest chinese and the greatest lords of the empire were entered into it to share the honour of the long and brave defence the great number of troops that were in this city took away from the besiegers all hope of taking it by open force therefore they resolved to starve it out and the famine became so great in peking that the men chose rather to eat one another than to yield notwithstanding the chinese bravery availed them nothing for the city was taken by a stratagem which being reported to the king of china he conceived such displeasure that he poisoned himself this is the tale of the capture the besiegers suffered so horrible a famine that they were obliged to decimate the men and out of every ten kill one to feed the other nine the besieged defended themselves so valiantly with their arrows and engines that when stones came to fail the engineers they melted down their gold and silver which were in great abundance in that place and used it to shoot against their enemies but at last the moguls having received a supply of provisions and finding they were no nearer taking the city than they were the first day undermined it and made a way underground which reached to the middle of the city and in the night assailed the chinese who surprised with a stratagem so new and strange lost all courage and were obliged to surrender the city to the moguls the king of china believing this place impregnable had shut himself in it and was killed with his son the moguls and tartars who were entered into the city opened the gates to those without and gave no quarter to any they met with and they plundered it of all that was precious or valuable and afterwards divided the booty according to Genghis Khan's law. End of section thirty three. This recording is in the public domain. Section thirty four of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Dirge of Genghis Khan by Unknown. Genghis Khan conquered Central Asia from the Caspian Sea and the Indus River to Korea and the Yangtze Kiang. He was about to attack southern China when he died in 1227. His body was buried in his own country, and it is said that it was borne to his native land on a two-wheeled wagon, escorted by his enormous number of followers. As they journeyed, they wept and wailed and one of the old comrades of the dead warrior chanted a dirge which has been handed down to this day the editor willem thou didst swoop like a falcon a rumbling wagon now trundles thee off o my king hast thou in truth then forsaken thy wife and thy children and the diet of thy people o my king circling in pride like an eagle will whom thou didst lead us o my king but now thou hast stumbled and fallen like an unbroken coat o my king end of section thirty four this recording is in the public domain section thirty five of china japan and the islands of the pacific ready for LibriVox.org by Brianna China Part 4 Stories of the Great Khan Historical Note Not many years after the death of Genghis Khan, Kublai ascended the throne. He overcame what opposition survived and reigned as emperor of all China, save for Arabia, Hindustan, in some of the western districts of asia he ruled from the pacific to the Dnieper river and from the arctic ocean to the straits of malacca there was much for these white tartars to learn from the chinese the mongols had had no definite laws for instance if a man was accused of a crime he was tried before some official and if he was found guilty 
he was punished as the official thought best. Moreover, the Tartars gave nothing in charity. If a poor man begged of one of them, he would receive the reply, Go with the curse of God, for if he loved you as he loves me, he would have provided for you. Many of the Tartars now adopted the religion of Buddha. This teaches charity to man and beasts, for who could say but the soul of some one of a man's own relatives was embodied in the beggar who pleaded for alms, or in the hungry dogs whose wistful eyes pleaded for a meal. End of section 35 This recording is in the public domain. Section 36 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 36. The Palace of the Great Khan in Kambalik, Peking by Marco Polo. Kublai Khan was a good ruler to the Chinese, and did well for the country. He was anxious to know more about the rest of the world, and when he was told that two merchants from Venice were in his city, he was delighted, and sent for them at once to ask questions about their rulers, how they lived, how they went forth to battle, and in what manner they administered justice. After these two merchants, the Polos, had remained in China for some time, they returned to Italy. Then they journeyed eastward again, and this time they brought with them young Marco, the son of one of them. The young man put on the Chinese dress, and learned the four languages most used in the country. This pleased the Khan, but something else pleased him much more. He was hungry to know about the distant lands and the manners and customs of people, but when his officers returned from an embassage, they had nothing to say, except to make reports of the business on which they had been sent. They are fools and dolts, declared the emperor, and to the men themselves he said, I had far liefer hearken about the strange things and manners of the different countries you have seen than merely be told of the business you went upon. It chanced that Marco was once sent away on a business matter. He kept his eyes open, and when he returned, he had a long story to tell of what he had seen. The emperor was delighted. At last he had found a man after his own heart— he sent the young Venetian on most important missions, and listened eagerly to the lively stories that he has always had to tell on his return. After the Polos had gone back to their own country, Marco wrote a very interesting book about his years in China, or Café, as it was then called. The following stories are taken from this book. The Editor you must know that it is the greatest palace that ever was. It is all on the ground floor. Only the basement is raised some ten palms above the surrounding soil, and this elevation is retained by a wall of marble raised to the level of the pavement. Two paces in width and projecting beyond the base of the palace so as to form a kind of terrace walk by which people can pass round the building and which is exposed to view whilst on the outer edge of the wall. There is a very fine pillared balustrade, and up to this the people are allowed to come. The roof is very lofty, and the walls of the palace are all covered with gold and silver. They are also adorned with representations of dragons, sculptured and gilt, beasts and birds, knights and idols, and sundry other subjects and on the ceiling, too, you will see nothing but gold and silver and painting. On each of the four sides there is a great marble staircase leading to the top of the marble wall, and forming the approach to the palace. 
the hall of the palace is so large that it could easily dine six thousand people and it is quite a marvel to see how many rooms there are besides the building is altogether so vast so rich and so beautiful that no man on earth could design anything superior to it the outside of the roof also is all colored with vermilion and yellow and green and blue and other hues which are fixed with a varnish so fine and exquisite that they shine like crystal and lend a resplendent lustre to the palace as seen for a great way around this roof is made too with such strength and solidity that it is fit to last for ever between the two walls of the enclosure there are fine parks and beautiful trees bearing a variety of fruits there are beasts also of sundry kinds such as white stags and fallow deer gazelles and roebucks and fine squirrels of various sorts with numbers also of the animal that gives the musk and all manner of other beautiful creatures insomuch that the whole place is full of them and no spot remains void except where there is traffic of people going and coming the parks are covered with abundant grass and the roads through them being all paved and raised two cubits above the surface they never become muddy nor does the rain lodge on them but flows off into the meadows quickening the soil and producing the abundance of herbage from that corner of the enclosure which is toward the northwest there extends a fine lake containing foison of fish of different kinds which the emperor hath caused to be put in there so that whenever he desires any he can have them at his pleasure a river enters this lake and issues from it but there is a grating of iron or brass put up so that the fish cannot escape in that way moreover on the north side of the palace about a bow shot off there is a hill which has been made by art from the earth dug out of the lake it is a good hundred paces in height and a mile in compass this hill is entirely covered with trees that never lose their leaves but remain ever green and i assure you that wherever a beautiful tree may exist and the emperor gets news of it he sends for it and has it transported bodily with all its roots and the earth attached to them and planted on that hill of his no matter how big the tree may be he gets it carried by his elephants and in this way he has got together the most beautiful collection of trees in all the world and he has also caused the whole hill to be covered with the ore of azure which is very green and thus not only are the trees all green but the hill itself is all green likewise and there is nothing to be seen on it that is not green and hence it is called the green mount and in good sooth it is named well on the top of the hill again there is a fine big palace which is all green inside and out and thus the hill and the trees and the palace form together a charming spectacle and it is marvellous to see their uniformity of colour everybody who sees them is delighted and the great khan had caused this beautiful prospect to be formed for the comfort and solace and delectation of his heart End of section 36. This recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eva march tappan section thirty seven how the great khan ate his dinner by marco polo and when the great khan sits at table on any great court occasion it is in this fashion his table is elevated a good deal above the others 
and he sits at the north end of the hall looking towards the south with his chief wife beside him on the left on his right sit his sons and his nephews and other kinsmen of the blood imperial but lower so that their heads are on a level with the emperor's feet and then the other barons sit at other tables lower still so also with the women for all the wives of the lord's sons and of his nephews and other kinsmen sit at the lower table to his right and below them again the ladies of the other barons and knights each in the place assigned by the lord's orders the tables are so disposed that the emperor can see the whole of them from end to end many as they are further you are not to suppose that everybody sits at a table on the contrary the greater part of the soldiers and their officers sit at their meal in the hall on the carpets outside the hall will be found more than forty thousand people for there is a great concourse of folk bringing presents to the lord or come from foreign countries with curiosities in a certain part of the hall near where the great khan holds his table there is set a large and very beautiful piece of workmanship in the form of a square coffer or buffet about three paces each way exquisitely wrought with figures of animals finely carved and gilt the middle is hollow and in it stands a great vessel of pure gold holding as much as an ordinary butt and at each corner of the great vessel is one of a smaller size of the capacity of a firkin and from the former the wine or beverage flavored with fine and costly spices is drawn off into the latter and on the buffet aforesaid are set all the lord's drinking vessels among which are certain pitchers of the finest gold which are called verniques and are big enough to hold drink for eight or ten persons and one of these is put between every two persons besides a couple of golden cups with handles so that every man helps himself from the pitcher that stands between him and his neighbor and the ladies are supplied in the same way the value of these pitchers and cups is something immense in fact the great khan has such a quantity of this kind of plate and of gold and silver in other shapes as no one ever before saw or heard tell of or could believe there are certain barons specially deputed to see that foreigners who do not know the customs of the court are provided with places suited to their rank and these barons are continually moving to and fro in the hall looking to the wants of the guests at table and causing the servants to supply them promptly with wine milk meat or whatever they lack at every door of the hall or indeed wherever the emperor may be there stand a couple of big men like giants one on each side armed with staves their business is to see that no one steps upon the threshold in entering and if this does happen they strip the offender of his clothes and he must pay a forfeit to have them back again or in lieu of taking his clothes they give him a certain number of blows if they are foreigners ignorant of the order then there are barons appointed to introduce them and explain it to them they think in fact that it brings bad luck if any one touches the threshold howbeit they are not expected to stick at this in going forth again for at that time some are like to be the worse for liquor and incapable of looking to their steps and you must know that those who wait upon the great khan with his dishes and his drink are some of the great barons they have the mouth and nose muffled with fine napkins of silk and gold so that no breath nor odor from their persons should taint the dish or the goblet presented to the lord and when the emperor is going to drink all the musical instruments of which he has a vast store of every kind begin to play and when he takes the cup all the barons and the rest of the company drop on their knees and make the deepest obeisance before him and then the emperor doth drink 
but each time that he does so the whole ceremony is repeated i will say naught about the dishes as you may easily conceive that there is a great plenty of every possible kind but you should know that in every case where a baron or knight dines at those tables their wives also dine there with the other ladies and when all have dined and the tables have been removed then come in a great number of players and jugglers adepts at all sorts of wonderful feats and perform before the emperor and the rest of the company creating great diversion and mirth so that everybody is full of laughter and enjoyment and when the performance is over the company breaks up and every one goes to his quarters end of section thirty seven this recording is in the public domain